Aloha and welcome to the Ruderman Roundtable. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I'm from the Big Island. I represent districts of uh, Puna and Ka'u. And we talk about uh, politics, good government, and environmental issues here on our Think Tech program every other Tuesday afternoon. My guests today are Tim Zhu and Bart Dame. Thank you for joining me, guys. Aloha. Good to be here. Timothy Zhu is a graduate student in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management at UH Manoa with a research focus on wildlife ecology. He's involved locally as an organizer in the Graduate Student Organization of UH Manoa, the Democratic Socialists of America, and the Young Progressives Demanding Action. Bart Dame is a national committeeman of the Hawaii Democratic Party and a respected longtime political exer observer who has written for several local and national publications. Thank you for joining me, Bart and Tim. It's very nice to have you. Thank you for having us. And we were hoping that we had to talk about uh, politics per se. You folks are both, uh, you both involved in the political, progressive political scene here in Hawaii, and that's a great interest of mine. And so we want to talk about the current political situation from your perspective. Tell me, what what defines someone as a progressive? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I'll take a shot. Okay, I, think, I think progressive is, uh, by, by necessity, sort of an ambiguous term, um, but I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people and organizations claim the mantle of progressive. I mean, I've seen an advertisement of McDonald's where they claim to be a progressive and modern burger company, for instance. Oh, really? I would, you know, disagree with the idea that McDonald's is progressive in any sense. Um, okay. And, you know, politicians will claim the mantle of progressivism when necessary. Um, I think to be progressive um, means to be left of center. Um, I think it means while uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're anti-capitalist, but I feel like you, you have to have some kind of criticisms of the current systemic uh, economic order. Um, I think that you have to stand for social, racial, economic justice uh, to some degree. And um, I think that it means, you know, being progressive to me in this modern day and age means that you're for policies such as single payer health care, a living wage, um, you know, paid family and pay, pay family leave, paid child care, that sort of thing. Okay, good. Anything you want to add to that, Bart? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, Tim comes from a different generation than I do. Uh, I probably started yeah, which, calling... Which one's older? Now? I, I think he's a few months older than oh, I am. Okay, I um, but I started getting involved in political activism when I was a high school kid, and uh, I started hanging out with the SDS and the draft resistance people and mm -hmm. picketing the Marine base near my Kailua house where I grew up uh, against the war in Vietnam. Okay. And so... Um, Probably by the 70s, I was using progressive to describe my politics. Um, and so I have a slightly different conception. I, I think Tim is right that it is, a, it is nece of necessity, it is an ambiguous thing, it is an evolving concept. I think there are some things that are constant. Um, I think that it, it, I may be showing both my educational bias and my historical roots that I think the progressive movement comes out of sort of the enlightenment spirit. Uh, what it is, we believe that we apply uh, human intelligence to the world around us, society around us, and and humane values, and try to say how do we build a society that is rational, that is just, that is sustainable. And so concerns, I use the word sustainable now, whereas before much of the focus was on class justice and economic justice, and now there's much more interest in addition to those things uh, with environmental justice and sustainability. And what is common to there is that one can argue as to whether McDonald's or capitalism is progressive. In a certain sense, it is. It is moving forward. It is transforming the world. But there are costs and there are benefits. And I think the progressive vision is that the cost should be borne equitably and the benefits should be shared equitably. And that the more rapacious aspects of capitalism, where there's short-sighted pursuit for profits, cannot be allowed to destroy the interests of the planet, of the ecosystem, of people as a whole. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add, I have no disagreements there at all with Bart's characterization of what progressivism is, and uh, just would like to add um, as another thought that it, it, progressives are, I think, concerned uh, deeply with the expansion of democracy in different spheres of our life. Okay, good. Is there a difference between progressive and liberal? I use it, again, this is my historical roots. Um, 
you're a much younger man than I am, of course, Russell. But, um, <laughs> but I remember there were Cold War liberals. That was a term, Cold War liberals, uh, when I was young. And Hubert Humphrey was running for president in 68 when I was 15, and I was adamantly against the war in Vietnam. He was the classic liberal. So the word liberal to me has not always had a positive association. To okay. me, it's sort of been a, a, a weaker, more compromised version of what I think a progressive should be. And so um, I, I embrace the word progressive, and I, it gets confusing because the Clinton people tried to run away from the word liberal, and they tried to use the word progressive as an alternative, as a more centrist articulation. But I, I see it as more to the left from, from liberals. Okay, good. Thank you. So we see uh, this year, we see a tremendous uh, surge in uh, political energy and involvement, of, particularly amongst young folks today, particularly amongst young progressives. What's behind the surge of young folks being involved in politics, and how can we help cultivate it even more? You're younger. I would, lo would love to answer this okay, question. Um, so I, just to put in perspective, I'm 29 years old. Um, I, I remember significantly my first coming of, like, coming of age, I guess, in terms of political enlightenment was I think um, I would have been a sophomore in high school, and uh, that's when we were marching off to uh, start a war in Iraq. Uh, that was like 2003. Um, and even then, I thought there was something completely wrong about what we were doing. Um, you know, youth, people my age um, and younger and older, uh, millennials, um, you know, we've been, like our entire adult life, we have been at war in, you know, multiple countries, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, we're currently bombing something like eight or nine different countries. Um, we've been in Afghanistan for 16 years now with no end in sight. Um, we've seen the failures of our foreign policy. Um, when, I, when I came out of college, um, it was right in the middle of the, the recession. Um, and uh, wages have been stagnant for, you know, 40 years. Uh, we have, you know, we, we've just come of age in this time where, you know, People my age were the were the most well educated generation, um, and yet we also were also graduating with the highest burden of student loan debt. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just all these material pressures have just driven us by necessity to uh, a radicalization in terms of political ideas, um, which was you know uh, which was reflected um, last year in the primary campaign of Bernie Sanders, who um, who proposed policies. Uh, that directly addressed these these concerns. You know, uh, nobody nobody talked about um, nobody talked about the recession and the the role that the banks had the way that Bernie did when he talked about breaking up the big banks and establishing a financial transaction tax on Wall Street. Um, nobody properly addressed the uh, you know the disastrous healthcare systems that we have in this country that are controlled by corporations um, the way that Bernie Sanders did when he proposed his Medicare for all system. Um, all, all, all these factors and more, I think, contribute to the uh, more radical politics I believe you see in the youth today. Um, okay. Bart, do you have any additional input to that? Well, um, again, it's uh, from a different generation perspective, but probably confirming the same thing. Um, a few years ago, I was testifying on behalf of, of raising the minimum wage. And I went after Lowell Kalapa, who's now deceased, but who was a leading lobbyist for business interests uh, under the guise of being a tax uh, expert. And we talked about minimum wage, and Lowell said, well, I worked minimum wage when I first started as a teenager, and it was good for me, and it helped discipline me. And there were a couple things that were wrong with that. It's like, I entered the job market just a couple years behind Lowell, and at the time I entered the job market, the minimum wage was $1.60. This is 1968, 69, okay? That same minimum wage at the time when we were, we were testifying was more like, would, adjusted for inflation, would be more like $9 an hour. And so what Lowell was saying, and, and the minimum wage by law was seven twenty-five. What Lowell was saying is it was good for us under those circumstances. It allowed us to get training to enter a growing, expanding economy and get careers and learn, you know, workplace discipline. But he was ignoring the fact the minimum wage was now, you know, thirty percent or less more that young people who are entering the market now are not entering an expanding economy, and it's not the beginning of the careers, and a lot of people earning minimum wage are actually older people who have lost their high-paying union jobs or secure jobs and are now working for minimum wage jobs. So it's a very different thing. But the reality of starting your working career with 
pessimism about your opportunities under this system as opposed to the growth that existed during the 60s and 70s. It's like a very different attitude and yet a lot of young people have embraced progressivism as a pragmatic as well as principled solution to the kinds of problems they face, whereas a lot of us were doing it for idealistic reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think it's utterly pragmatic, the policies that we're embracing here. You know, there was this kind of characterization of a lot of uh, Bernie Sanders' policies, for instance, in the last year as being, you know, idealistic pie in the sky. But, you know, there's nothing idealistic about wanting to have health care for everyone, you know, in my opinion. Um, and, yeah, that pessimism, I think, is real, that what, what Bart refers to, I mean, um, my impression is that in the 70s, you know, a, a person could uh, graduate out of high school into a decent union job and be able to afford a house, a two-car garage house, you know, with uh, be able to have a family just on, the, on those mm -hmm. wages alone. And uh, now, nowadays, that's almost seen as like a sign of being like upper class, which is uh, utterly absurd to me. Um, or I could work during the summer, mm -hmm. a summer job, and pay for my tuition for going to college, which is now not possible. Exactly, and I, you know, I read a, actually a very fascinating study just yesterday where uh, something like a majority of, I guess, baby boomers, you know, uh, like older Americans, a majority of Americans polled um, thought that their children were were going to have a lower standard of living and lower mm -hmm. wages than they did. That's the first time ever. Yeah, for the first time ever. Um, and you know, you couple that with just everything else happening in the background, you know, the, the ice caps are melting, permafrost is melting, polar bears are dying, and we, we're kind of growing into this age where it just seems like the system is not working and we want to change. So what I think I hear both of you saying are <coughs> long-range trends that have been growing for really decades. But what made it seemingly explode last year? Why is there suddenly, this year and last year, so many more people involved, do you think? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, um, you saw, you know, last year you saw, like, uh, the explosion of two distinct phenomena, uh, not, not distinct, I mean, I think they're connected in some way, but both the, the radical right-wing populism of Donald mm -hmm. Trump on one side, you know, the xenophobic and nationalistic, um, but somewhat, you know, giving shout-outs to economic populism in certain ways, you know, whether it was against NAFTA mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, the sh offshoring of American jobs. Uh, and then on the other side, obviously, you had this sort of more left-wing populism of Bernie Sanders. Um, I'm not sure why. Well, I just wonder, was been. Bernie Sanders the the symptom? I mean, the, the, was he the Absolutely. thing that prodded it, or was he the result think, of this I wave think, that's been building for a long I think Bernie time. Sanders recognized an energy there that was, you know, he, he was turning around the country prior to starting his uh, presidential campaign, and he mm -hmm. was trying to gauge uh, whether the energy was there for this left-wing outsider like himself. Um, so I, I, I do think that um, he is more, you know, a symptom rather than, you know, he, he rode this wave that has been building, whether it was Occupy Wall Street in 2011 mm -hmm. or um, other similar other similar protests that have been racking the country in the years prior. Yeah, I think basically what Bernie did is, let me preface this also by, I was introduced as national committee man. I'm, I'm speaking as an individual here. I am the national okay. committee man for the party, but the party's not responsible for what I'm saying here. I'm barely responsible for what I'm saying here. Um, but I worked on Bernie's campaign. I, I had worked on um, Jesse Jackson's campaign in 87 and 88. I had worked on Dennis Kucinich's campaign in 2004. In each of those things, we had a certain limited amount of success that kind of shook up the establishment a little bit, but nothing like what happened this time. Right. And, and I think that Bernie was not a charismatic guy, except that his lack of charisma was part of his charm, right? He was a straight shooting uh, grandpa who was telling it like it is, and he was sometimes being impatient, and sometimes being incredibly patient, and he was trying to educate a lot of people who were sort of alienated from and hostile to elective politics, and saying, listen, this is how it is, suspend your disbelief, you know, learn for yourself, but if enough of us turn out, we can win this thing. And he would organize us to do that. So a lot of people sort of did suspend their skepticism, particularly younger people, mm -hmm. who were not voting. They said, okay, right. we can vote for this guy. And uh, the hope was that we would build a movement that, whether Bernie won or lost, we'd educate a whole new crop of people in how to use the organs of electoral democracy to strengthen real democracy over the workplace, over the environment, over policies, over government, and take care of a real human needs. Yeah, I want to come back to one of the points you just made about <coughs> you know, whether those, all these young people are voting or not. But we have to take a, a brief break. I'm here with Bart Dame and Tim Zhu on the Ruderman Roundtable on Think Tech Kauai, and we'll be back in just a moment. Thank 
you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Living in this crazy world. So caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense. Aloha and welcome back. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. We're here at the Ruderman Roundtable with Tim Zhu and Bart Damon. We're talking about politics in Hawaii and progressive politics in particular. So we're talking about this tremendous involvement of young folks and uh, progressives last year. How close are they, are we, to really seeing a true political revolution, especially given the fact that we're still seeing less than 50% of young folks voting, less than it was in previous generations. So are we on the verge of a true political revolution, or is there something missing here before we can really see some change? My, my own perspective mm -hmm. is that we're in it for the long haul here. Um, I think just any kind of historical analysis of, I, I think about the election of, um, you know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, who's considered one of the, you know, the, Neil, the New Deal Democrat, one mm -hmm. of the most progressive politicians in our time. Um, and I think what, what gets lost in his, uh, behind his election, you know, in the 30s was just, I think, decades of work, you know, in organizing uh, mm -hmm. in the right uh, situations, uh, in the right economic and historic context. Um, so, Going to the modern day right now, I think we're, we are st seeing steps, um, formation of new groups, uh, strengthening of uh, currently existing groups uh, that are all working towards um, looking at building a change at the national and local level in 2018 and 2020. Um, whether or not that succeeds, I think will just de depend on the strength of our organizing. Mm -hmm. um, Bart, do you have an opinion on this? Um, I, you use the phrase about FDR in the historic context. I think that. Um, Many of us are looking at what's happening now. There's a breakdown, there's a lack of optimism for the future for a lot of regular working folks. It seems like parents are seeing the standard of living of their kids declining, people are getting out of college in debt rather than having an optimistic view about how their career is gonna go. So I think the old order has a hard time being seen as legitimate by very many people. And part of that's really rooted in the extreme inequality. Uh, so the benefits of increases in technology and efficiency and even globalization, the benefits go to a very small group of people and the costs are being borne by the least powerful people in society. And so it's hard to get a buy-in from the vast numbers of people who see their standard of living going down and have little reason for optimism. Because there's not a clear model going forward, the last election in some ways was a struggle between the uh, regressive populism of Donald Trump, who tried to appeal to the negative aspects of people's fears, versus the better angels approach of Bernie Sanders, right, who was putting forth this democratic socialist uh, sort of vision that we can take care of all of our people. We don't have to rail against, you know, the Hispanics, against the immigrants, against the Muslims, against the gays, against the uppity women, and all the things that Trump tried to say. But instead, we can all come together for our common interests. And I think that is the battle. And it's not clear which side is going to win. It's not clear that either side is going to win around a clear kind of model rather than a muddled sort of model. But I think that's what people are looking for. They're looking for some sort of clarity. And so some of the same people who might give in to their internal racism or their misogynistic views and go with Donald Trump, some of those same people, I think, can be won over by a more class perspective, which is what Bernie's been doing. When Even after the election, he's gone to these red belt areas and talked to working class coal miners, right, about the new economy, and they actually resonate with mm -hmm. him. He is the most popular politician in the United States today, by far, and he's popular among Democrats, among independents, but also among a lot of these people who ended up voting Republican, but still yet know that Donald Trump is kind of a uh, reality show kind of comic figure rather than someone who's really gonna lead them into the promised land. Yeah, and I would also just like to add, I mean, this is my optimistic side coming through, but rather than seeing Donald Trump as being some, uh, some frightening new, out of the ordinary uh, uh, symptom of, I, I view it more as the, 
the last decaying, you know, gasp of a dying order. So uh, the last hurrah. Yeah, that, that, that's personally my hope. I mean, I, think I, vo I vote for your view too. I hope, <laughs> I hope you're right, Timothy. That's for sure. So we're t talking and looking at the midterm elections next year. What are the current stumbling blocks looking forward to next year's elections? What do we have to watch out for? What can we hope for next year? Well, the national level, uh, and this is sort of inside internal of the Democratic Party, but it's it's among. Uh, among Democratic voters, and I'll include pro most progressives in there and most Democrats in there, um, I went to the Atlanta meeting of the DNC where we elected um, new chair of the Democratic Party. This is shortly after, a few months after the disastrous election in November. And so there were two candidates running, uh, Tom Perez and Keith Ellison, and I went there as a strong Keith Ellison supporter. Both of them were, broadly speaking, progressive. I think Keith was the more consistent progressive. But when Tom Perez won by a narrow margin, and this is in the highest reaches of Democratic Party, to get into the DNC, you've got to pay some dues, you got to pass through a lot of filters, but even in that, the higher reaches, the party was split almost 50-50 as to which way to go, and with some opting for a much more progressive uh, approach. Tom Perez, immediately upon uh, winning the election, said, I move to suspend the rules and allow me to appoint Keith Ellison as my deputy chair, and everybody in the room said, okay, now we have a chance to work together. Mm -hmm. Now, since that time, uh, the DNC has been sending Bernie Sanders and Keith Ellison, as well as Tom, around the country, barnstorming for Democratic candidates in special elections and trying to, to rally the base. Uh, they've been running into opposition from some Bernie or Busters who are saying, Bernie, what the hell are you doing supporting the, the DNC? They're all corporate sellouts. And from hardline, unrepentant Clinton supporters, not all, but some of the more obstinate ones saying, DNC, why are you empowering Bernie Sanders? For the immediate time, medium term, it is important there be a strategic alliance between progressives and mainstream Democrats so that we can take control of one or both chambers in the midterm elections in 2018, or if we don't quite do that, at least improve our numbers. Because we have to push back against Trump, we have to build a strong united front against Trump, but we also have to offer a progressive alternative to Trumpism, which is what the progressive message is that Tom Perez is embracing, but Bernie Sanders and Keith Ellison are obviously stronger advocates for. Okay. What can the progressive movement do to gain the attention of mainstream Democrats? or it's a better game. You, this is just what you were just talking about. We're sort of split right now. What can progressives do to help unify the party or to, to get the more centrist Democrats to not fear this progressive movement? Well, I think in order to win, I think it's, again, it's sort of like I said, there, there was the pragmatism underlying a lot of youthful people being attracted towards, towards uh, progressive thought. I think that the progressive message, I think, is one that can rally the vast majority of working and middle class people in this country behind the Democrats. But when you have run candidates who seem like they're co-opted by uh, Goldman Sachs and, and Wall Street uh, and are more sympathetic with that sort of uh, view than with working people, then you, people are not going to vote for Democrats. They're going to vote uh, according to these scapegoat theories that are thrown their ways against the various evil boogeymen and stuff that the Republicans, particularly Trump, have been very good at, at advocating. Let me ask a little bit, we're talking nationally here, but what about uh, on the local level in the state of Hawaii Democratic Party? I've had people observe that this, the party, people who come to conventions who are active in precincts, is much more progressive than the elected officials that we have in our state. Why is that, and can we change it? And it's, there seems to be a gap to me between who makes up the Democratic Party and who holds elective office that the elected officials are quite a bit more conservative than the party today is. Well, th okay, the party has to be, <laughs> the party's not really clear what its function is, but in my conception, uh, the party has a different function than the elected officials. And part of our job is to not just exhort the politicians to support the Democratic platform, but again, to go back to FDR, where FDR says, okay, you've convinced me about these progressive policies, now go out there and make me do it organize public opinion, make it so that if I don't 
uh, promote progressive policies that take care of the needs of most people. My chances of winning are not that good. Make it so that if I do support those things, you will be there to protect me, to defend me, and to get me reelected. That's the role, I think, of the Democratic Party. Some people view the Democratic Party as though we should be ideological policemen trying to enforce the platform. I strongly disagree with that point of view, although I used to hold it very adamantly. I believe what we have to do is use our connections and experience we acquire through the Democratic Party to run more progressive people for office as Democrats and defeat the more conservative corporatist ones as individual Democrats using the skills we acquire and do it through small d democratic ways rather than through sort of a law enforcement model which is to say oh you're not honoring our platform so we're gonna kick you out of the party that's the wrong approach to take. Okay. I also want to touch on that I think um, I, I think Bart kind of alluded to it um, I think that just focusing on uh, just figureheads, uh, not figureheads, but you know, representative senators, uh, you know, elected officials is also in a way putting the cart before the horse. I think um, wh what you don't see behind somebody like FDR is that FDR had to be pushed significantly to uh, enact the policies they did. And what was he pushed by? He was pushed by you know radically strong unions back then in the 30s and the 40s. He was pushed by mass movements out there in the streets. You know, I mean, uh, what you didn't see, you know, was outside the White House, which just you know hundreds of thousands of people out there, you know, protesting and pushing for movements. Hmm. I want to switch subjects for just a minute, uh, Tim, because I have you here. And recently, the Labor, National Labor Relations Board ruled that graduate students at private universities are employees and essentially paving the way to pol collective bargaining as if they were a union. Should those at public schools be allowed the same option? I know you're involved in your graduate student organization, which is Yeah, like absolutely. Uh, so I'm a graduate student at UH Manoa, and I work as a teaching assistant. I, uh, this last semester, I taught uh, two sections of calculus, um, had over 100 students. Um, and I absolutely do think that graduate assistants should be given the right to unionize. Um, and that's the case um, at all private universities, as you said. Um, since this historic ruling last year, we've had um, unions petition at Harvard, Yale, New Chicago, Columbia, New York University, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's the case at public universities in every public university in, in um, California, Washington, Oregon, and other states across the country, uh, New York. Um, and there's no reason why uh, Hawaii's public university should not join this movement. Um, you know, graduate assistants are, uh, are taking on more and more of the day-to-day -day administrative and teaching and research work at the universities. Uh, we contribute to the local economy. Uh, we educate, you know, our local people, and um, you know, we're workers. And uh, you know, uh, unless we want to just be taught to accept lower and lower standards of uh, pay and working conditions, um, I think you'll find that the decline of union densities nationally has been is strongly correlated with the increase in wealth inequality. Um, I, I think we deserve a union. Okay, good. Very well answered. Thank you. So. Uh, I'm here with Bart Dame and Tim Zhu. They're both progressive Democrats, very active in the political uh, organizations in our state. And I want to give each of you just a, a, a couple of seconds to let people know how they can reach you and your organizations if you're interested. Bart, would you like to, anything you would like to share? How people can reach them? Well, okay, I, I work with a number of groups, depending on, and I'm not sure who, who I should embarrass by saying I'm, I'm on the board of a, of a nonpartisan group, uh, the Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. Uh, probably our most ambitious project right now is the Kuleana Academy, which is to uh, find, identify, and train uh, young people, and not even not that young people, who want to run for office, so we teach them the mechanics of how to run for office, regardless yeah, of what party. find that organization online if um, they wanted to, or if it's I would search, do a Google search for um, HAPA. HAPA in Hawaii. Okay, okay. Uh, in Hawaii. And then you can also search for Kuleana Academy. I also work with Progressive Democrats of Hawaii, and I also do work with the Democratic Party as well. Okay. How about you, Tim? Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, so I work with several different organizations in the local community, including YPDA, Young Progressives Demanding Action. Uh, the group that I'm currently uh, working the most with is uh, Democratic Socialists of America, which is okay. Uh, the largest and fastest growing socialist organization in the country. Um, and I think with uh, Bernie's election, he's the most pop, or not his election, but his, uh, his you know, <laughs> primary election, victories yeah. at, at multiple states. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a historic opportunity. He's the most popular politician in the country and is an open democratic socialist. Um, and this we're is a national organization then, right? This is, yes. and we're not a party, we're an organization. Uh, we work on uh, multiple issues on multiple fronts, uh, and we're dedicated towards building a, a working class mass socialist movement. Okay, wonderful. Well, I want to thank you both so much, Bart Dame and Tim Zhu, for joining me here on the Ruderman Roundtable. And thank you to Think Tech Kauai for hosting us. We'll be back again in two weeks with another Ruderman Roundtable. Mahalo for joining us.